Chapter 4. Can Memories Really Be Changed? According to the latest in neuroscience, memories are neither accurate nor permanent. In fact, memories are automatically updated according to new experiences. Even the precious memories of our childhood can actually be shaped and reshaped like a ball of clay. Memory errors can be considered the norm, not the exception. Dr. Julia Shaw If you've ever had a conversation with family or friends about an event you all experienced, you may have found that everyone seems to remember it differently. One of our clients shared the following. He told me he was bitten on the lip by a dog when he was about three. But it wasn't him. It was his brother who was bitten on the lip and still has a scar. If memories are already inaccurate and changing, and we have the ability to change them intentionally, why not change them to benefit and empower ourselves? Memory reconsolidation therapy is already being used to treat those suffering from PTSD. However, one of the reasons that the results are inconsistent may be that memory reconsolidation is usually used for the memories of the events that appear to have caused PTSD in the adult instead of the original childhood memories that provided the references for those events. Not everyone who experiences the same traumatic event develops PTSD. In fact, not everyone who experiences the same event experiences it in the same way at all. As the event is happening, each person's brain refers to their own references from previous experiences to determine what the new experience means and how to respond to it. Everything we experience is filtered through the structure of who we are and how the world works based on childhood experiences. And then that new information is added to the existing structure. For example, two babies are born at the same time in the same town. Mary is born to parents who are loving, financially secure, happy, fulfilled, who have effective emotional coping skills, and who can't wait to meet their new baby girl. Jane is born to parents who are stressed, struggling financially, aren't ready for a child, and whose emotional coping skills involve shouting and the silent treatment. Every individual's life experience is, of course, unique, which means that the structure of who the person is and how the world works for them is unique. As these babies grow, each girl's brain will be interpreting all of their experiences automatically and forming a structure of meaning. Mary's brain will interpret the complex combination of loving and caring experiences from her early childhood from both of her parents to create a structure that includes, I'm loved, valuable, and heard. I light up a room. Life is abundant. I'm clever. Everyone loves me, and life is fun. All those references boil down to one thing. I'm safe. As humans, we're not equipped to survive alone. From birth, we're completely helpless and dependent upon those around us. Therefore, part of our automatic survival instinct is to please those around us so that they'll prioritize feeding and protecting us. If we're loved, valuable, and the center of their attention, we're safe. We'll be fed and protected above anyone else, which to the unconscious part of the brain means survival. Survival and protection are not just about food, clothing, and shelter. I remember as a child hearing parents say, oh, she's just looking for attention. Saying that child is just looking for attention is like saying that child just wants oxygen. Instinctively, attention is survival. If I'm rejected by my tribe, I'll die. Children don't just want attention, they need it. It's part of the unconscious survival instinct. Surviving school. Now let's take a look at Jane. Jane's brain interprets the arguments between her parents, impatience, tension, and lack of affection, compassion, and kindness to mean, I'm not important, it's not safe to have fun, I'm not valuable or heard, I don't matter, I'm not understood, there's not enough, and stress is normal. All those references boil down to, I'm not safe. 
Out of these references, both girls will develop a unique set of survival skills and coping mechanisms as they go through life. Fast forward now, and both girls are starting at the same school. Each girl arrives in this new environment full of new experiences and people with a completely different set of references that prove who they are, how the world works, and how to survive. Mary, with her structure of I'm safe and life is fun, will automatically express confidence because her brain contains proof that she's safe and that people love her. Jane, with her structure of I'm not safe and life is stressful, will automatically express symptoms that reflect this. Depending on the combination of references, she may appear disinterested, anxious or irritable, or she may even come across as overconfident and bossy. The first impression she makes will depend on the unique combination of coping skills that have developed automatically and unconsciously through her experiences so far. Since Mary's brain and body are conditioned to produce mostly feel-good chemicals and she has normal levels of stress, her prefrontal cortex will be online most of the time. This will mean she's able to concentrate, process information, problem-solve and retain and recall information more easily and effectively. That, of course, leads to her doing well in school academically. She's also, because of her references, a natural team player so she fits in well with groups, sports, and activities. On the other hand, since Jane's brain and body are conditioned to produce mostly stress chemicals and she lives in a state of fight or flight, her prefrontal cortex is offline most of the time. She doesn't have access to that cognitive thinking part of her brain, so no matter how much she may want to do well in school, she literally cannot access that part of her brain needed for problem solving, communication, concentration, absorbing, comprehending, processing, and recalling information. She also hasn't developed the social skills needed to fit in. And most importantly, because her references prove she's not safe, her coping skills have automatically developed to make her either a people pleaser or wary of others. You can see how each of these girls will develop very differently throughout their school experience. Now, imagine both girls have the same experience of a bully saying something mean to them. In that moment, Mary's previous references prove she's not in danger. Mary may find the bully's remark mildly annoying, she may not think it worth paying attention to, she may find it funny, or she may not even register it at all. In that moment, Jane's previous references prove she's in danger. Jane's brain pumps more stress chemicals into her system, and her experience of the bully's remark will be one that further proves she's unworthy, stupid, or whatever that experience means to her through the filters of the structure that already exists in her brain. The bully's words, expression, tone of voice, and body language will mean something different to each girl based on what references they already have. And of course, the encounter with the bully is not just about that experience. Jane's reaction to it will have a knock-on effect on her experiences with everything and everyone moving forward. Mary's reaction to that experience, or the lack of it, will have little to no effect on her interactions moving forward. According to the CDC, adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, can negatively impact education, job opportunities, and earning potential. As adults, Mary and Jane are working in the same office and earn the same salary. However, while Mary is able not only to save, but also able to invest and build a solid financial foundation, Jane is in debt and struggles to pay her bills. In addition to everything else that's in place already in the brains of both women, every decision, including financial judgment, ability to assess risk, and awareness of opportunities, is determined by the evidence in those original childhood memories that proves who they are and how the world works. For example, 
Mary feels confident asking for a raise because she knows from the evidence in her implicit childhood memories that she's worth it. She also has the ability to communicate her worth and ask for a raise in a strategic manner. On the other hand, Jane knows from her evidence in her implicit childhood memories that she's unworthy, and that affects the way in which she asks for a raise, if she ever asks for it at all. When an opportunity comes up that would result in financial loss, Mary's brain filters that information through the structure of, I'm worthy, and the world is an abundant and safe place. And since she has access to her cognitive thinking, she recognizes the risk, so she turns it down. Jane's brain filters the same opportunity through different references that prove that she's unworthy, is undeserving, and that stress is normal, and it seems like a good idea. Since she has proof from the implicit memories from her childhood that there is not enough, she also has a fear of missing out. This fear causes her brain to overlook the risk, and she invests in the opportunity. She ends up losing money. Another opportunity comes up that would be financially beneficial. Mary's brain filters the opportunity through the fact that she's worthy. And since she has access to her prefrontal cortex, she's able to process the information and make a decision based on strategy and problem solving, which leads to an increase in her financial situation. Jane's brain filters the same opportunity through the facts of I'm not safe and stress is normal. And since the improved financial situation would not be in alignment with that self-image and worldview, her brain discounts it and labels it as a bad option. Stress chemicals are pumped into her system, she doesn't have access to her cognitive thinking, and she finds reasons to turn down that opportunity or procrastinate until it's too late. Now let's say that Jane finds a way to change the implicit memories from her childhood that prove she's unworthy, not safe, and that stress is normal to the opposite positive and empowering. In other words, she replaces her original childhood memories with new childhood memories that are similar to Mary's experiences. Is it wrong to change memories? While Jane will still have declarative memories of what originally happened, or consciously she knows what she experienced in her childhood, her new implicit memories, or unconscious memory, will now automatically prove that she's worthy, safe, valued, and lights up a room, and that it's safe to have fun and feel good. It's a bit like when you learn a new phone number. When you think of your phone number, the new one is the first one to come to mind, or implicit memory. While you can still consciously or intentionally recall the old one, or explicit memory. The brain is constantly changing and adapting as we experience and learn new information. The ability of the brain to update information based on new experiences is known as neuronal plasticity. Experiences are not just physical events. Experiences include imagination. Since the unconscious part of the brain can't tell the difference between reality and imagination, as you imagine the new memory, your brain experiences it. As you repeat it, firing the same neural patterns, those connections become stronger and the memory becomes established as fact. Adding strong emotions to the new memory causes the brain to prioritize consolidating the memory for long-term storage. Now, when new opportunities come up with these new implicit memories, not only will Jane have new references that affect her perception, judgment, and risk assessment, she'll also, due to the lack of stress chemicals in her system, have access to her prefrontal cortex, her cognitive thinking. Consequently, she will automatically make decisions and take actions that are in alignment with that new self-image and worldview. When we helped Alice to change her childhood memories of her relationship with her parents to the opposite positive and empowering, her self-image and worldview changed accordingly. As a result, her perception, choices, decisions, and judgment also changed. 
She found that she was no longer triggered when someone didn't respond to her. And most impressively, she found she was no longer attracted to emotionally unavailable men. In fact, she started finding kind and compassionate men attractive. Alice can still remember consciously what her parents were like when she was a child, but her implicit memories are now those of love, affection, connection, and validation from both of her parents. The result is that although she can still recall what originally happened, the unconscious part of her brain now refers to the new evidence that proves she's loved, valuable, important, and safe. And that completely changed her self-image and worldview, and in turn, her life experiences, to the opposite, positive, and empowering. When I think of my childhood now, it's filled with memories of love, affection, kindness, compassion, safety, fun, freedom, peace, and abundance. But I can still tell you what really happened. I can still tell you that from the age of six in Durban, South Africa, I worked before school at 5.30 a.m., after school, weekends, and holidays, including Christmas Day. I worked in heavy costumes and in humid heat, always on duty, wishing I was playing on the beach with the other children across the road. I can still tell you that there was no payment for that work, so in addition to an over-the-top work ethic, I developed the belief that I don't deserve to be paid. I can still tell you of being beaten, the fear, the shame, the bullying at school, growing up without a father, financial struggle, emotional pain, and of other damaging experiences. I can tell you about all of that because while those memories no longer form the foundation of who I am and my world view, they are still declarative memories. They are still there if I need or choose to access them. But it is the new childhood I created in the unconscious part of my brain that provides the evidence for who I am and what I experience in my life now. I have happy memories from my childhood as well. And I've kept those, of course. We can keep the positive memories and just change the negative ones. My parents and grandparents did the very best they could considering their own childhood references. My mother and her parents each started working at four years old. They had unimaginably tough lives with suffering and struggle at the core, which formed their reality of who they were and how the world worked for them. From the self-image and worldview created by those childhood experiences, they were amazing. From the self-image and worldview created by their childhood references, through their eyes, they gave us the most wonderful childhood, a childhood they could only have dreamed of. It's over, but it's not over. When Elaine came to one of our workshops, she had already been through two years of conventional talk therapy. She knew that her traumatic childhood had created the depression, anxiety, and panic attacks she'd experienced for so many years. But spending time recalling and exploring those childhood memories had done nothing to reduce the emotional pain she continued to suffer. She'd been told to let go of the childhood loss and abuse since it was no longer happening. While she could consciously reason that her childhood was over, the unconscious part of her brain continued to keep her in a state of hypervigilance and stress, as if it were all still going on. Reliving negative experiences causes the brain to re-trigger that flight-or-fight state of survival over and over. Since the unconscious part of the brain can't tell the difference between reality and imagination, can't use logic or reason, has no sense of time, and can't judge something as unrealistic, it produces the same state when you think about the memories as it would if the events were happening now. Reliving negative memories is not the solution. Reliving negative memories keeps you stuck in a time warp of suffering. Recap. Memories are neither accurate nor permanent and are already changing and being updated. 
memory reconsolidation, or memory editing, is already being used to treat PTSD. Changing a memory means imagining the event differently and then repeating that new version until it's established, as you would learn a new phone number. Just as when you change the coordinates in your GPS, you as the driver can still remember your previous destinations, while the unconscious part of your brain will refer to the new, empowering memories, you will still be able to remember what originally happened. Explicit memories.